Wendell Stanley called me in when the whole thing first began to surface. I already knew a lot about it. And he sort of guessed, anticipated, that I was not going to sign the law. And he asked me my views, and I told him I was opposed to it. I was opposed to the policy of barring communists. I related the story of J.D. Bernal, who was you know, one of the great scientists of, in our field of science, started crystallography in England, who was a, well, a well-known, avowed Marxist. And why couldn't he be a professor at the University of California? Just because he was a communist. It didn't bother me one iota. So, uh, so I was opposed in principle, <laughs> as were many of the other non-signers, uh, like Chick Kenbrook, Ken Torowitz, and so on. But uh, so Stanley anticipated that, and he, uh, I knew that I would not have any problems with the head of my department over my principled objection to loyalty oath, that he would be extremely supportive of me, as indeed he was. Whereas that was not true of some friends of mine who were in the chemistry department, mm -hmm. where they knew that if their word got out that they were opposed to the oath, they would suffer in their own department in a very subtle way, rather than uh, just because of their opposition to the oath. So in that regard, uh, you know, I watched the various departments. Uh, it was it was fun to watch. Chemistry had very few objectors, partly because they knew the top brass in the chemistry department uh, would not support them. Whereas in physics and mathematics, sociology, places like that, you had many uh, non-signers. Uh, and originally, there were a couple of hundred of us originally, and that got watered down substantially over the time. So, but we had these periodic, uh, what I called group therapy sessions uh, at the and uh, we would compromise left and right, and uh, and uh, it uh, just went on for a substantial period of time. There was a period when, in fact, uh, when you hadn't signed the oath, you weren't getting paid. Mm -hmm. Stanley couldn't believe that I was not getting my paychecks when I went to see him, and uh, he then offered me money at periodic intervals because uh, I was not receiving a salary check. So you didn't receive a check, and then and then they realized that the, the adverse publicity over them. This was sort of General Motors fighting the United Auto Workers or some hierarchy like that. And uh, they realized that this was a very unsatisfactory posture. So all of a sudden, my back pay showed up. Oh. So, But, but then they used every you... trick in the books, essentially, mm -hmm. to coerce people uh, by fear, timid, intimidation, uh, to sign the loyalty oath. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And finally came up with this proposed compromise that um, you would have hearings. And that was when they changed the Committee on Academic Freedom and uh, uh, made a much safer committee. Hold on one second. Okay, I mean. We're back on now. <laughs> okay, just adjusting the mic. Um, I guess I'm, if you want to say more about the loyalty, maybe talk about why you eventually did sign it. How, how did that come about? Uh, let me see. I'm trying to figure out because there was a second oath, the Levering Oath, that came along at a later time. It was a state. That see, was one, after the. One was imposed by the regions and right. the other was imposed by the legislature. And at one stage, I can't remember, maybe uh, I was, I'm very unhappy about the oath. And I actually uh, met with the head of the American Civil Liberties Union of Northern California. Yeah. for one of these oaths. I can't remember exactly which one at the top of my head. And they asked me about being a, um, a, a ser serving as a case study for this particular thing. I had been in the Navy. I had signed loyalty oaths. I had no objection to loyalty oaths per se, but I didn't like the loyalty oath at the university because they singled out the faculty and because it was really a device for implementing a policy with which I was in complete disagreement. So serving in the United States military, you sign a loyalty oath to defend the United States government. But that was beside the point at the University of California. Ours was designed essentially to eliminate communists yes. from the campus. And we still have that policy and I'm still opposed to that policy. So uh, the ACLU asked me would uh, uh, I be willing to go to court with them sponsoring the court case. And I spent a lot of time uh, with meeting with them at periodic intervals, calling my very f various friends. And finally, uh, I was told by, for example, Max Laufer, who was at the University of Pittsburgh by that time, a very distinguished uh, 
a top-notch professor at the University of Pittsburgh, and he warned me that I would never get another job. Things look bad. This would be rise of McCarthyism in mm -hmm. the United States. And one of my good friends was head of a major committee at the National Science Foundation, which was starting to give out money, and he indicated I wouldn't get a grant. So when I saw that my career was in jeopardy, I had either one or two young kids at that time, I decided that this was too risky. And with great reluctance, I decided that I would not be a non-signer. I had no idea that there would be money raised to support you because I had no income at all other than that salary. And um, I was astonished later to see how well the faculty raised money throughout the country for the 30 or so non-signers. Mm -hmm. So just at the very, very end, uh, I decided I would not have a hearing because I was convinced it wouldn't amount to very much and they would find